Marketing Today is sponsored by Light Matter. Light Matter helps some of the world's fastest growing companies build top notch software applications. Whether you're just starting your business transformation and you don't yet need an in house engineering team, or you're busy growing the next unicorn startup and can't hire fast enough, there's an immense value in working with a group of software experts like Light Matter. The New York Times, Bloomberg, Code Academy, Greatest, and dozens of others have already trusted them to help design and deliver their websites and apps. Check them out at lightmatter.com. That's L-I-G-H-T-M-A-T-T-E-R.com. And tell them that Alan sent you. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart. This is Marketing Today. This episode was recorded live at the Insight Brand Marketing Summit in San Francisco. The topic of this panel discussion was storytelling deconstructed, the hard data behind emotive creative. And I had three panelists join me for the conversation. Nathan Thornburg, CEO and co-founder and editor-in-chief of Roads and Kingdoms, That's an organization that creates premium content, frankly, for brands and for television programs, most notably um, Anthony Bourdain's episodes and and programs that he's most known for. I also have Noah Jacobson, Senior Vice President Corporate Development and Strategy of TapClicks, a technology company that aggregates data sources um, and helps people make sense of it through uh, analytical tools as well. And then finally, I had Brian Border, former vice president of CRM at Shutterfly. Um, and most people in the United States, I would think, know Shutterfly. They do on-demand printing for cards, books, all kinds of things um, for personal use. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and the live audience questions that we fielded at the end as well. I'm going to let my panelists um, introduce themselves. So uh, why don't we just go down the line? All right. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Nathan Thornburg. I'm a co-founder of Roads and Kingdoms, which is a production company and media outfit uh, that I started and ran with Anthony Bourdain and Matt Goulding. I am currently also the host of uh, the Trip podcast on Luminary Networks. Uh, Here's much more interesting than mine. <laughs> I mean, we should all have, we probably do all have podcasts, but that's mine. Awesome. Um, Noah Jacobson. SVP Corp Dev Strategy um, at a company called TapClick. So we are a marketing operations platform. We work with agencies, media companies, enterprise. Uh, started in the reporting analytics side, data aggregation, analytics, data visualization, and have added a lot of additional components all around helping with execution and, and really helping you get all the data you need to tell that. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Border. Uh, I spent seven years at Shutterfly. I just uh, left the company uh, last month, but I was in their uh, marketing organization. Um, in some of my earlier roles, I oversaw the uh, email marketing and direct mail programs. And in uh, my last role there, I was leading a uh, cross-channel uh, customer marketing initiative to uh, make much greater use of customer data to go from uh, take take Shutterfly from a one size fits all communication approach to a much more customized and personalized uh, approach that served up products and messages that were uh, uh, uniquely relevant to uh, each of uh, our individual customers. Great. So the topic today is storytelling deconstructed: the hard data behind a motive creative. And since we've got. Noah here and his company um, aggregates data and puts it together. I thought maybe we'd start with you, the yes. data guy. And uh, <laughs> what what advice would you have to marketers as they're thinking about trying to get more out of the data that they have? Yeah, so I, I think it all starts with the data, right? And so it starts actually really starts with understanding your audience, understanding what's that story you want to tell. And then once you've got that, the ability to really know uh, what data is required to tell that story, and then obviously a little shameless plug, but how do you actually gather that data uh, to tell that story? So the first two I leave up to the experts, and actually what's ironic about it is we said that 
10 years ago when we started our company was like, oh, we'll build this really great platform that's going to give everybody the data they need to tell a story. And then we built this amazing platform and then we gave it to marketers and they were like, awesome, what do we do now? Right? And so we, it was the typical, like, lead the horse to water and you think they're going to drink and you got to help them drink. And so for us, that was a big wake up call to our platform that it wasn't just a matter of getting the data. Well, that's the technical piece. It was how do you give them the tools to be successful? How do you help them tell a better data story when they don't have all the data they need? Um, and then obviously, who's the audience? So is that uh, internal? So are you trying to sell that with your team? Is it selling it up to the executives for budget approvals? Or is it an agency who really has an end customer that they really have to cater to? But they want to make sure that message is on point. So you want to make sure that that goals, those objectives, and that story you tell really matches. And it's not just a data dump on them. So those are the four four key areas. Great. Well, Brian, you were at Sh Shutterfly most recently. And I know when we talked earlier, you talked about the, the um, need and the, the pressure to show conversion, but that yep. you also felt that there was a need for other types of content to be telling stories or to highlight things and make people aware of what was available that wasn't purely focused on conversion. So how did you balance those two things at Shutterfly? Yeah, it was kind of a it's kind of a never ending challenge. I'm sure it is with uh, many uh, many organizations, if not all organizations. But by 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 providing a little bit of context, or to step back and provide a little bit of context, uh, Shutterfly definitely um, had a uh, had points in my time there when um, we were kind of really laser sharp focused on uh, the short term, and as a publicly traded company, trying to uh, always hit our quarterly targets, and so. We found we found points in the time at Shutterfly when we were probably putting too much energy, too much focus, and too much budget towards trying to uh, get uh, consumers to convert uh, right then and there to uh, continue to drive immediate revenue, hit our quarterly targets, and uh, keep the uh, keep the business healthy. Uh, the challenge with that is the average Shutterfly customer. Uh, only only purchases from Shutterfly anywhere from one to two, maybe three times a year. Some some of our best customers uh, purchased more, but um, when you have a year-round marketing program and you have customers that are uh, only buying uh, a couple of times a year, just based on uh, what their specific needs are, um, you have this obvious uh, this obvious disconnect. And if you're just trying to uh, sell them hard with a promotion and a product-focused message that's just trying to drive immediate conversion. <laughs> Uh, you're going to be wasting a lot of energy and a lot of impressions on the uh, on the consumer. Uh, we actually had a point a couple years ago when uh, we stepped back and looked at sort of, sort of the relative share of energy and budget that was being spent on conversion-oriented activities versus more top-of-the-funnel brand-building engagement activities. And uh, in that particular year, we realized that um, we'd shifted pretty dramatically towards short-term conversion uh, focus. And the thing is that doesn't necessarily show up in the immediate term, but if you do that for a long enough period of time, you're starting to uh, denigrate your brand. And um, and then it does translate into uh, more challenging, uh, bigger challenges to uh, continue to generate the revenue that uh, that you used to have. So uh, that uh, that really uh, kickstarted us to focus more on brand building, engagement, and storytelling types of activities. And at Shutterfly, that uh, that takes a number of different forms, and that's everything from having uh, emotional videos that uh, we may post on our social sites that uh, showcased uh, the reactions of different consumers when they were presented with holiday gifts uh, uh, that were of Shutterfly products. So a great example is somebody seeing a, a book of... Uh, their late husband that their kids had made for them. And just the emotion that comes out of that is, is really powerful. And it's a great way to remind people of the value of, uh, the value of Shutterfly. And, you know, we got tons of engagement and tons of, tons of views of that, of that video. We also, uh, we also added a, uh, and really embellished a section of our site that was called, that's called Ideas, that is literally just focused on inspirational types of, uh, topics. To, uh, to keep the customer engaged, even if they weren't ready to purchase right then and there. And that's everything from uh, here ideas for uh, planning a, a party for the, the graduate in your household. Here's uh, the right time if you're getting married. Here's the right time to send save the dates and wedding invites. Uh, if you are refreshing your home, here are tips on how to, uh, how to design your, uh, your wall appropriately. So we invested a lot in this ideas, ideas page as well. And there were a number of other, uh, initiatives that we took as well to, uh, to really build and really, um, re 
really invest more in top of funnel brand building engagement activities. So to actually get to your question, um, in terms of how do we... Uh, I was going to come back to A lot it. of yeah, background yeah, yeah. and context, yeah, that's good. but hopefully that, it'll, it'll be helpful. I, th I think in part, you know, how, how we sort of solve this is, we, we were, as a marketing organization, we had to push hard for engagement and storytelling metrics to have a seat at the table when business discussions were happening. So it's not just about how did we do in terms of uh, conversion and revenue from all our mar marketing activities over the last week or month, but um, we also needed to really push and inject the uh, discussion around uh, around engagement-oriented metrics, and that's everything from viewing a video to uh, engaging on our social channels to clicking through an email to go to our site. And so part of it was just sort of practice and repetition and helping people understand uh, the value of that at uh, in terms of building the, uh, the longer-term uh, brand equity that uh, translated into uh, brand loyalty and, uh, and, and more sustainable revenue over the longer term. The last thing, uh, last thing I would say is, uh, we found a Shutterfly a lot of times we get caught up in this very sort of binary set of discussions around, uh, something is either engagement oriented or it's conversion oriented and there's sort of no in between. But, uh, one, uh, one thing that I was working on during my, my last, uh, role at Shutterfly was making better use of customer data to identify which of, which of the, which portion of our customers are actually have a high likelihood to purchase sometime in, uh, the next couple of weeks versus who are customers that no matter what you do, they're not going to purchase anything from us. And so that allowed us to be a lot more sophisticated in terms of dividing up our audience, uh, and dividing up the messages that they were getting. And so some people were getting more brand building, engagement oriented messages, whereas other people who are likely to purchase were getting more product and promotional types of messages. That's great. So Nathan, when we talked, I had this funny image in my head of Anthony Bourdain behind an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> crunching the numbers to figure out what he was going to say on camera. And I know that's probably nowhere in the, in the realm of possibility. Yeah. I mean, he, he was famous just on set, uh, on his television show for sensing that somebody was about to tell him something that might approach being something that he should do. And then when he would immediately just put us a, a complete stop to it, uh, and say, nope, that's not, we're not going to talk about what's happening in the next shot or anything. Right. And, you know, and even as, uh, as an investor, as you and I were talking about, I mean, yeah. he, and this kind of gets into our approach, I think, to, data and marketing and how to make good content, you know, he would call me up and we'd, I'd try to give him the numbers about how we're doing in terms of audience and revenue. And he would sort of say, well, okay, that sounds fine. But, you know, just remember to just, just make it a little darker, more lurid and transgressive, uh, which were the three things that, you know, that was his bullet points of like what he wanted to see out of, uh, out of the company, which is as an investor, that's a really weird thing to say. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like kind of what Brian was saying about being like too on the nose with how you use data or how you're looking at the work that you're doing. I mean, I feel like data was behind every RFP that we answered, every project that we get involved in. There's somebody who's been thinking a lot about audiences and, and where they're trying to get with the content that they're going to be paying pretty good money for. Our job is then to forget all of that, you know, right? We kind of like take in where they are at as clients and then we're going to say, great, okay, we've heard you. Now we're going to go and make it a little weird. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the main things for us, uh, having come from a journalism background, especially is just keeping it personal, like making sure that your personality comes through in whatever content you have. It seems counterintuitive, especially if you're at the end of a long chain where data and kind of, you know, audience as, as a kind of group has been discussed a lot, but really when you're creating something, it's got to have your point of view. Otherwise there's nothing to grab onto as a viewer or the listener. They just don't know who you are and why you're talking to them in that way. And I think that a lot of that's been driven also by kind of internet media culture. Like it's a very first person light kind of content world that we live in. And I, I, I don't rail against that at all. I think it's great, you know, so it, it kind of gives you the opportunity to state who you are in relationship to the video that you're presenting or the story that you're telling. And I think we've seen, at least with our audience, like that's what they're looking for is to know who's talking to them. And the, the final thing, which I think especially, you know, we deal a lot with travel and food um, and these kind of great pleasures of life. I think a lot of times marketers and content 
content marketing people forget to put in some grit, like something that sucks, right? Because there's so, there's such a tendency to go straight for gloss. What you find is that, you know, it's a very human need to have some sort of arc, like some sort of problem to solution journey that even a simple or a small piece of content will take you on. And if you don't have that, if you're just presenting a piece of content that's like, shit is great and it just keeps being great, then nobody's really going to pay attention to it. So for us, it's been, you know, that's part of our, you know, how we've learned to look at these things. Sometimes it's an education with, you know, people who are on the client side to just let them know, like, we're, we're going to present some challenges that might be present in your destination or in the, the, the wine that you make. But then we're going to get to a place where everybody's going to be pretty, pretty satisfied at the end. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stay with you for a minute, Nathan, and I'll come back to Brian and, um, and Noah. But it, you do use data towards the tail end, right? You've got a piece you're working on, you're trying to put it out into the world. You mentioned something I had never thought of before when we talked before about how data comes back into the equation on the distribution side. Yeah, I mean, as, as a media company especially, we'll often package audience and distribution into content that we make, and uh, and then we have some very specific goals that people want to reach. What we find is if we don't follow some of our own rules, or if we have come up a little short in terms of making content that's incredibly engaging, you know, you, you can buy an audience these days. Like everybody knows how to do it, and it's a it's a healthy part of a lot of campaigns. We just find it gets very expensive if you have to buy a lot of audience because your content isn't clicking enough that people aren't the audience isn't making itself, and that's a you know it's a great. I would say it's a, it's a great punishment for, you know, falling short in, in your content goals because you will have to pay Facebook and Google to make up for what you lacked in your, in the edit room. Right. And, you know, for us, it's often, you know, we can see it happening mid campaign so we can recut, we can kind of move things around on social, figure out different ways to, to make this more approachable or, uh, have it click more. And then we don't have to pay, uh, you know, the big guys to, to just, create the audience that we should have made on our own. Right, right. That's great. So, Brian, you had an example, and I believe it was around the holiday campaign. And I wondered if you could talk to me about, like, what, tell us a little bit about that. And then, you know, what was the data that led to the insight? And where where'd you go with it from there? Yeah, sure. So, so one of our uh, biggest products at uh, Shutterfly is uh, is selling holiday cards, and uh, that uh, that is something that kind of makes or breaks breaks our holiday season, and uh, the holiday season kind of makes or breaks the year. And a few years ago, we uh, we were doing research by talking to uh, consumers, both current Shutterfly customers and people who hadn't been Shutterfly customers before, to understand why they had or hadn't bought uh, holiday cards in the past. We, uh, we learned from, uh, from folks who hadn't bought holiday cards specifically over this past year that it wasn't, the primary reason wasn't because of price. It wasn't because of the selection that Shutterfly offered. It wasn't because they ran out of time, although that did factor into uh, a lot of the answers. But the number one reason uh, why people didn't buy holiday cards from us in a particular season was because they didn't have a, uh, a good enough photo of their family to, uh, to make the card. So that uh, that really sp- you know, a light bulb went off in our heads that uh, really shifted our focus towards uh, uh, about the window in which we talk to our consumers about holiday cards, which is typically in November and December during the, the core holiday period. We realized that, hey, uh, there's this huge opportunity at other times of the year to remind people about hol- Shutterfly holiday cards and to remind them to get uh, – to get pictures of their family during times when uh, their family was going to all be together. And so the classic example was we started investing a lot more energy during uh, the summer months when families are on vacation, uh, reminding them about holiday cards and saying, get those uh, get those great family photos now that you can then use in our holiday cards a, a bunch of months later. Um, that worked uh, that worked really well. Um, and then one year um, after that period, we learned the hard way. Um, that uh, we th- that how valuable that was to really seed uh, holiday card messaging and content uh, much earlier uh, in uh, than in the in the holiday months. We learned the hard way about how important it was because uh, we we saw holiday card sales uh, go down one year, and uh, when we looked back, we realized that we'd sort of taken our our foot off the pedal and hadn't uh, from a, in terms of what we'd done in prior years. We didn't invest as much in those uh, upfront impressions, those upfront. Uh, inspirational types of messages and helpful reminders and tips uh, that we've done in previous uh, previous years to get people thinking about holiday cards much, much other than the holidays. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Noah, what are the watch outs for either agencies or enterprise companies as they're trying to piece together the right story and the right insight from this data? That's I mean, I around. think that that's a really interesting, the idea that you ran campaigns at a different time of year and you lost sight of that and then you might not have measured it properly yep. and you didn't kind of bring the data together. So I think for us, one is just too much data, right? It's just this crazy influx. Mm -hmm. We've done 250 uh, native integrations in our platform. We've brought in 2,500 2, different data feeds. Of those data feeds that we've done, uh, upwards of 50,000 endpoints and APIs that are brought in on a daily basis. Uh -huh. So when you just get into, say, Facebook ads or whatever it is, I mean, you have 1,200 you know, data points that you can measure. Uh, you can start at the campaign level and you can go all the way down to the ad placement level. Mm -hmm. And so I think it really comes down to really being clear about measure what matters. And so why are you doing it? What's the purpose? Um, and then getting really clear on what are the, you know, it kind of goes back to business terms, right? KPIs mm -hmm. that matter. Mm -hmm. And then pick out a couple of key KPIs that are really measuring what you want. And then have the other data available uh, upon request. Right. So everybody's always going to ask questions. They're always going to kind of dig deeper. Uh, but I think the, the, the key in that storytelling is to really get the message out mm -hmm. and then be able to provide the other data set. So I come from a world where that's what we do. We just make it so the data is available to you. I think that the real struggle, too, is just getting the data available. Right. Uh, we deal with so many enterprise clients. And we deal with a lot of agencies, and, and what I like to say a lot is enterprise companies, you know, there's a data struggle, and so enterprise companies and big brands believe that they own the data, and they might, if there's questions, but who owns access to data? And so a lot of times the brands, while they're using agencies around the world, they're still living in this world of 30, 60, 90 days that it takes them to get a real ROI story back. And that's because they're so contingent on everybody else to get them the data they need right. to justify the spend. By that point, you talk to you know the Walmarts of the world, the big real players. I mean, they spent a billion dollars. Maybe they spent three billion dollars by the time they found out what three campaigns ago did. So uh, we're in a data world. You need to have it. You need to get access to it. You need the tools to do it, but you need to know why you're doing it, um, and then make sure that that story actually resonates with whoever it is and then cover your ass with all as much more data as you can. All right. Good. Well, I want to make sure we have time for questions, so feel free to submit your questions, guys. Use the Slido app. Um, and maybe we can pivot back to uh, storytelling. And uh, I think, Nathan, you were telling me a story that I didn't even realize was a thing, right? A branded con the first ever primetime Emmy won by a branded content piece. And that was one of the parts that you guys did. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that was, um, I mean, for me, if anything, it's kind of a, a parable for where we are in branded content, you know, and I think especially I'd worked for a decade as a, as an editor at Time Magazine. I was, terrified of brands. I mean, we were taught to be uh, just very, very wary of, of having anything that would be kind of commercially relevant. Uh, we never knew what was happening on the other side of the, the wall with revenue. And, you know, fast forward to today where I truly believe that the end consumer feels much more empowered to make their own decisions about whether a piece of content is legit, right? It can be branded, it can be, you know, paid for by a client or a company, as long as you're transparent about where that's coming from and you're not doing some kind of queasy product placement and not telling them about it or something. I think you, you know, it's a much more open world in terms of what they just want to see if it's interesting. Like, are, is it good? Like, do I want to watch this to the end? And it doesn't, it doesn't have to do with feeling like it, it couldn't have been touched or couldn't have a marketing goal in the end. So for us, we had this joint project that we did with CNN called Explore Parts Unknown, which was a way to uh, both engage with brands and uh, marketers who wanted to be close to the un Parts Unknown show but didn't want to do broadcast television or wanted a digital component. So we created a digital home for journalism around all of the destinations in the CNN show. And as part of that, we had these kind of marquee video projects that we did with Land Rover, which was our launch sponsor, and also with uh, All Nippon Airlines. So 
these video series were uh, expensive and they were fun and they were shot on location around the world and they were kind of in the in the style of uh, the Parts Unknown show and Tony was involved uh, both on camera and as a producer. I never in a million years thought that the Television Academy would allow it to be entered. I mean, to be honest, like we we thought we would be disqualified right out of the gate because it says right at the beginning, it's got a big old Land Rover right there. Like this is a Land Rover <laughs> video series. But the one that we did with uh, with Tony in Los Angeles called Little Los Angeles, uh, and it's basically six episodes of him doing what he did so well, just kind of eating and drinking and talking through six different ethnic enclaves uh, in the LA basin. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't rocket science, but it was shot and conceived with a lot of heart for the city and we submitted it to the television academy and they actually let it go through and it ended up winning a uh, a primetime emmy um which was incredibly surreal and you know i think for us it was obviously a great moment but for this whole concept that i think a lot of people in this room are invested in which is that really great content can happen in uh coming from a brand space i thought it was pretty uh revelatory and uh i mean that wasn't why we partied all night but it's a nice <laughs> little add on uh after that <laughs> yeah I'm all about the party. <laughs> it, was, it was there. Yeah. Well, it looks like we've got a couple of questions. So um, let me, I'll read a couple of these out. Uh, with all the data readily available, how do you decide when to pivot based on learnings or keep listening and learning? How to be responsive but not too reactive? Maybe, I don't know, who wants to take that? You want to go? Sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think part of um, I think it goes back a little bit uh, to the uh, to the, to what I was mentioning earlier about about making sure that um, storytelling and engagement and brand building metrics have an equal seat at the table as your other metrics as well. And so I think that um, one one learning we had at Shutterfly was while we were really good and all our systems were really focused on uh, measuring uh, um, shorter term uh, KPIs like conversion and revenue. Um, both our systems weren't set up in a way that uh, really enabled us to readily report on uh, more top of funnel activities. Um, and even when we did have that data, we didn't. We hadn't established that culture of making that part of every uh, every type of discussions that uh, that we had. And so, I, I think I think part of it is just structure and discipline, and that and by regularly looking at all your metrics and recognizing the value and the the, the value of, of the different metrics and what they can tell you, both short term and long term. I think that helps helps you get away from being so so reactive. Um, I've told a couple of stories at Shutterfly where. We looked at data sort of after the fact and it helped piece together a story of why things didn't, didn't perform um, as they did. And in retrospect, had we been more regularly monitoring all the data points you should have been looking at, uh, we, we could have prevented that and, uh, and made more real-time decisions. Well, Brian, do you have do you have an example for the next question actually too? Which is, I wish I could read these questions. Uh, I, I'll Brian. read it to you. Fair so, enough. can you can you talk about a time when you've misinterpreted the data and told the wrong story? How did you recover from that? I'm going to suggest you find another question while I think of that one. <laughs> okay, we'll okay. come back to you. Let me, we'll let me think about a good example for that. Um, Noah, this one might be a good one for you. Uh, I don't know where it went. Oh, what type? What type of roles or people do I need to be effective with data storytelling? I mean, you, you're consulting clients. You're putting this data together. I don't know if there are roles that you're. Yeah, yeah. Using no, I think. I mean, with. I think. Yeah, well, I mean, we started with agencies. That was really a big focus for us. So we were trying to build them a platform, a tool at scale that could help them tell a story back to their clients. Mm -hmm. What we found was they also. Uh, depending on the type of agency, so we work with a lot of large media companies or we've evolved into big agencies themselves, and they work with everybody from you know your top brands all the way down to your mom and pop pizza shop. Um, and so helping tell that story to the right audience just in who your client is, not to mention helping their sales teams literally tell a story to them so they can tell the story back to their client. And so I think all the way up and down, it goes all the way up to your kind of top level executives who want a high level aggregated story of how is our agency performing? You know, what platforms work best for us? Where do we make the most money? But what's our most effective, right? So they're telling an internal story about making business decisions. You know, the sales rep is really making decisions around 
you know, in a small, maybe a media shop where they've got 35 different pizza shops that might be there. They're, they're looking for a story of how do I upsell, cross-sell, um, and how do I use data in aggregate mm -hmm. to prove why the advertiser who's telling me they only want to spend, you know, five hundred dollars on a search campaign, why we should be talking ten thousand dollars, right? And so they're usually I, I talk about being on your heels, they need things to be on their toes. Mm -hmm. And so you need uh, account reps, you need anybody in marketing to be able to be on their toes. They need the data in hand to do that. And so it depends on the audience they're talking to, but they need flexibility and it needs to be quick and easy and they don't need to go to their IT department yep. and put in a request and hope that the data management team kind of like prioritizes them and they need the tools right. at their fingertips. So everybody's got to have data liter literacy, I guess is yeah. the right way to say that. Brian, you got an example. Ready. All right, go for it. Hey, go for it. Thanks for buying me a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so one example that comes to mind is is in the, in the earlier day, days during my time at, at Shutterfly, for each of our marketing channels, we had two different ways of measuring the uh, the impact of the channel, and there was our sort of cross-channel uh, attribution system, and then there was the individual channel uh, metrics that really just looked at how do your channel perform uh, irrespective of uh, whatever other exposure uh, your, your customers may have had to uh, the other, other teams' uh, channels. So. The specific example is with display marketing. So we uh, we made a lot of decision, a lot of investment decisions on display marketing that uh, were based on a belief that it was generating greater greater revenue and conversion, kind of in the immediate term, than it really was. Uh, we found uh, by looking by by shifting our focus more from looking at just display in a silo, but looking at the relative impact of display in an attribution system, we we realized that uh, that the impact of display was quite a bit less. And we were able to validate that by doing um, some control testing of uh, customers that uh, got exposure to our display ads and customers that didn't to really just sort of really hone in on the fact that the, uh, the expected impact that we thought it was having was a lot less. Um, so that it shifted our budget away from display a little bit, but it also, it also actually more importantly, it shifted our, the way we thought about display as a channel. So we looked at displays less, we were able to prove it out less as uh, something that uh, was really good at driving immediate purchase, immediate conversion uh, of our customers, but we still believed in it, but more of a, uh, of a top of funnel, a top of funnel channel. So, so even to this day, Shutterfly still, still invests in display, but just um, looks at it as serving a different purpose. And so it was only through being a little more rigorous with uh, looking at the, uh, the rel relative impact of that channel compared to all the other marketing channels that uh, allowed us to reach that conclusion. Awesome. Nathan, I'm going to come to you with this question. So the question is, how do you avoid confusing customers as your story evolves and changes? What about pivoting away from your original story altogether? Has that ever happened on uh, one of your programs? In terms like within a single campaign? I'm asking you like it was yeah. your question, but uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would, I would think that's more based on kind of almost like a medium, like where are you reaching people at, at what time? Mm -hmm. I mean, when we, what we see is, and, and there's a data story, I think, to be told about this. We also see it just kind of anecdotally and from an editorial perspective is when we, we have generally like these flagship video campaigns, these big projects, and then you distribute it across all these different social media channels. And the trick is always to be appropriate for your, for your outlet, for your platform. And Instagram has different needs than Twitter and Facebook. So you're presenting different versions of the same core narrative. I think what can happen and what we've seen happen a few times for ourselves is are you actually telling a kind of different flavor of the story? Will people be, you know, will they be confused when they get to the, to the, to the big flagship project? Because the thing that they saw on, on Instagram just felt like it had a different, you know, like that was all food porn. But then when you get to the actual video series, now you're talking about politics and, and, you know, as with, as with a lot of the work we do, they're all kind of combined in some way and everybody can either get a little something for themselves or end up being slightly confused about why they have to wait through, you know, some, this sort of heavier topic to in between dishes or something. Right. So for me, it's, it's more about, uh, just making sure that as you slice and dice your, your your kind of larger campaign and your larger project that you're representing it kind of faithfully while staying true to each platform. That's good. 
So the next question is, um, oh, I'm moving around. How would you change the mindset of executives to not just focus on the short-term conversion to longer-term customer value focus in a VC-owned situation? I, I want to know the answer because that's worth <laughs> millions, I think. Anybody want to take a stab at that? I mean, I'll hit it from uh, the idea that if you can't measure all the data, if you can't see it all in one place, then you're going to struggle to to justify each spend. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is, you get so siloed, and, and in a lot of large organizations, you get maybe an email marketing team, you get maybe a display team, maybe a search team, um, and they get really caught up in their own, and you, and you lose sight of the, the cross-channel, and how do you... How do you present that data back to justify the spend throughout the entire campaign and not by channel? Hmm. And so they're looking at bottom of the funnel and they're looking at what's actually re getting the true attribution and it's an attribution problem and it's never been solved and it's, it's a struggle. And if you don't own it from end to end, it's a super, super duper struggle. Yeah. I'll, I'll add a, a recent podcast episode I had with, um, um, Ty Shea from Norton LifeLock. Um, he's just recently left, but he talks about this concept of performance storytelling. He's been through five exits, I think. I may have that off, but LifeLock was one of the more recent ones that they sold to Symantec. But he has an investment banking background, so getting to executives and how they think. He had this concept of marketing jujitsu, which is if I'm getting pushed too hard on this notion of, you know, conversion, 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 um, and well, let's just turn it off and see what happens. And he's turned off marketing before multiple times just to huh. prove what happens when you turn off marketing. Right. Um, and then he's a big test and learn guy. So maybe for those that are out there that ask this question, just turn it off. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they might, they might, they might stop squealing. So uh, anyway, let's go to the next question. Uh, Let's see, can you, uh, I think we covered that one actually. I'm refocusing my channel's approaches to be brand relationship focused. How do I achieve this change while still maintaining short-term revenue sales goals? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I, I talked earlier about the, the concept of sort of sometimes, at, at least at Shutterfly, we get caught up in this very sort of binary type of focus to where things were either engagement oriented or or conversion oriented and the example I gave is that that can that can change from one customer to the next um, and there's some channels like an email is a really obvious one that allows you to really sort of enact that and so depending on what channels you're talking about you might be able to take more of a nuanced approach uh, to uh, to serve up different types of content to different types of customers at this at the same time. I also mentioned though that I, I manage the uh, the direct mail channel at, uh, at at Shutterfly, and that that was one of the few channels that really was looked at uh, to serve two purposes. And one was to really build awareness and engagement and uh, understanding of the Shutterfly brand and the offerings. And then hand in hand with that, it was looked at as a a, a conversion. Uh, a conversion channel as well. And so we, we, every year, Shutterfly sends a big 24 page catalog. They send other big mailers. And so we willingly paid more to have bigger pieces with more pages, uh, in it and more content in it, um, in order to be able to try to solve both of those challenges, uh, at, at the same time, instead of just feeling like we were stuck in this is a conversion piece or this is a, a, a top of funnel engagement piece. So i ask one last question to each of you. Hopefully it's a fun one. If you could have one data source or data point um, that you don't have today, uh, what, would, what, would you, what would it be and why? They're all thinking. I need like the Jeopardy clock. Or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think for me, just thinking back on my time at Shutterfly, and it goes back to a lot of, uh, a lot of what Noah's uh, been talking about, it's, it's, it's really been able to understand the full set of um, experiences and interactions and visibility that consumers had to your brand. So I know which consumers have seen display uh, display ads. I know which, uh, which customers have seen emails and which we've mailed direct mail pieces to. But I don't necessarily know what they've seen on Facebook and the social channels. Um, I don't necessarily know everything they're doing uh, on Google when they're uh, when they're searching, and I know there there are tools and vendors that uh, can provide some of that, but it's hard. And I don't think that solution's fully there yet, and so I think we can map that out 
uh, more holistically, uh, and as, uh, as Noah mentioned too, quicker than 30, 60, or 90 days, have that information, uh, I think that would, uh, that would shift a lot the, uh, the focus uh, um, in terms of where we put our energy at Shutterfly. I was going to say my wife, like her brain, right? So like, uh, that's a data source yeah. for sure. I'd love to get access. Um, There's a movie. It's good. Yeah. What women want or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, it's an old one, but it's a good one. I mean, I, one, and I try to stick to marketing, I, I think that's the problem. I mean, if we do just pick one, uh, you get a couple of big players out there that seem to own everything, and we're right. all kind of in trouble or we're all indebted to them, right? So we need to not pick just one. We need to find the right one for the right customer, the right audience, whoever you're telling the story to, right? So uh, it is not just one, but it, but it can be just one. <laughs> you're, you're doing that jujitsu thing. Yeah, right, right I know. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Nathan? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't even know if this would qualify as a data source, but for us in digital media, especially just, just knowing who the hell is on the other end of the line, you know, and if there was some way of just having much more of a sense of like, these are individuals and every once in a while we've branched out into live events or we'll have kind of dinners that we host, uh, did one in San Francisco, uh, some out in New York. And then it's just like this miraculous thing where all of these kind of, all of these audience numbers, some of them actually show up and they're in person and they're in a room. And then, you know, I feel like I've learned so much more about how they respond to roads and kingdoms just by having them show up in person. And, and I do feel that for a lot of us in digital media and certainly in marketing, experiential marketing is a, is a big deal because there's such value in that, like, in that individual, this real person that's not just a part of the digital kind of flood of information. Um, and I have, you know, as you're saying with the, like the holisticness, there's none of these tools have come close to really being able to tell me, you know, who these people are. We just kind of, we send out a net into the universe and catch some of them for dinner, <laughs> you know, and then they'll come by. But other than that, like, I'd love to have a much more complete vision of the individuals behind, uh, people who are consuming this content. Great. Well, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Have you ever wondered how fast growth companies design and develop top-notch software applications so quickly? That's where Light Matter comes in. They help the world's best startups and enterprises ship software applications from idea to finished product. Visit lightmatter.com. That's L I G H T M A T T E R.com and tell them Alan sent you.